Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the TV Toastmasters meeting of club number 9523. I would like to thank everyone for coming this morning. There were a lot of things going on today. Area division contest, tall stacks, but the people made it here and, and I'm thankful that they're here. We have a short meeting today, but it will be a very productive meeting. Our Toastmaster of the day will be Dick Reed. Dick is a professor at Gateway, Gateway and he, ha he brings a, a lot of fascinating information to our club. So I'd like to welcome our Toastmaster of the day, Dick Reed. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here today. And um, our first topic, or the first thing that we have on the agenda, is table topics. So I'd like to introduce our table topics uh, person, Rick Davis. Rick. Thank you, Dick. We haven't seen Dan Lather in a while, and I think it'd be good if Dan came. And so what we're gonna do is a little uh, assault journalism here. And so uh, the number one fear of Americans, I guess of everyone, is, is getting up in front of people and speaking. And I understand that you actually belong to an organization that forces people to get up in front of other people and present speeches. Steve, could you t t tell us about this horrible organization that forces people to get up and speak? Thank you, Dan Lather, fellow Toastmasters, and our Toastmasters watching in and from home, as well as our guests. This horrible organization that makes people get up in front of an audience or a camera and face their largest, or at least one of their largest fears, speaking in public. We're talking about Toastmasters. Now, one of the things I'd like to dispel is the idea that Toastmasters is this organization that is bent upon getting you in front of people and subjecting you to your worst fears in front of a large audience. This is not their primary objective. The purpose of Toastmasters is to provide a nurturing, safe environment where you can learn to listen, think, and speak and become more adept at doing this in front of an audience. This is a skill that you use in your everyday life, in your work situation. You may be in a situation where you attend a public meeting and you want to comment. This is another opportunity to do public speaking. What I've told the people in the club that I belong to is that we will do everything we can to make you more comfortable in front of an audience expressing your ideas, speaking to the situation at hand. I think the best way that I've heard it described is Toastmasters doesn't eliminate the butterflies, the anxiety, the jitters that people have doing public speaking, but it gets all the butterflies to fly in formation. You want to have a little bit of apprehension when you speak because this keeps you on the edge of being well prepared. However, you don't want it to be to the point where you are rendered incapable of speaking in front of people. And Toastmasters is an organization that does a lot to develop your skills in the situation of public speaking. Dan? All right, this next individual actually used to teach banned books. She actually used to be involved in teaching young, impressionable minds about books that had been banned in important places like Boston and uh, other places. Can you come and talk about all these banned books? Myrna. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank you, fellow Toastmasters. Uh, yes, this, this is a subject that is really near and dear to my heart, these banned books, because 
when I was teaching, often we would have parents that would come in and complain that we were teaching the children bad things. They would look through these books and find words or things that were, uh, were very offensive. And as a teacher, of course, I don't want to teach these children offensive things, and I don't want to aggravate the parents. So I did form a committee that we went through all of the books in our library and picked out the books that should be banned. If they had bad words in them or morals or um, uh, ideas that we felt were offensive, would offend somebody, we took them out. The problem was that we ended up with a very small library, but, but as years went on, then we were able to uh, find other books to full in, fill in for the ones that we had taken out. One of the ma most amazing things was that we found that the National Geographic, which I always thought was a wonderful magazine, was very offensive. And we had parents that actually complained about this. Well, there's a lot of nudity from the waist up and that type of thing, you know. So, so we found that we had to get rid of the National Geographics, or we had to go through them and tear out pages. And so generally, it was easier to just get rid of them. But um, we were left with a few books that we, we could uh, still teach, uh, let the children read. Uh, it, as I said, it did narrow their reading skills and their uh, their knowledge base a little bit, but, but we were able to take out all those offensive words and nude pictures and bad ideas and morals. That, so that's it. Thank you, Rick, for letting me talk about my favorite subject. This next individual has been known to dress up in old costumes and to present her depiction of that revolutionary person, Betsy Ross. And I wonder, Carol, could you come up and tell, explain to us this sickness that you have of wanting to display yourself as Betsy Ross? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dan Slather. I would be right at home today at Tall Stacks, although I think that was a little bit earlier. But Betsy Ross, I played an important part. I was one of, I forget how many children now, I think it was 11 or something like that. And when George Washington, I was known for my sewing, and when George Washington came to my shop and asked me to make the American flag, well, he wanted a six-pointed star. But I showed him with one snip of the scissors how you could have a five-pointed star because we, after all, there was a war going on and material was scarce. But because of using the five-pointed star, we saved fabric, and we were able to have this flag less expensive, and we were able to produce them. And I think history, to me, was not all that exciting. But when you have people depicting just as it was back then, I think you learn a little more about history. So I think it's good to dress up in costumes, Mr. Dan Lather. And I would <laughs> encourage people if you have children, make it personal. Become that person. Mr. Lather. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, here you have it. Live from Anderson Township, this is Dan Lather. <laughs> Turning it back to Mr. Toastmaster, Dick Reed. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Those were interesting topics and uh, allowed us all to get a little bit of practice at impromptu public speaking. The next portion of our meeting is going to be a prepared speech. And I'd, we have but one speaker today, and I would like to introduce him. I've known him very well all my life. Sometimes I'd like to get away from him, but I haven't <laughs> succeeded in doing that yet. So let me introduce Dick Reed. <laughs> think of it. Before I speak, could I ask my evaluator, Verna Gibson, to present my uh, goals for the speech? Verna? The objectives for um, Dick's speech, Straight Talk, 
is to effectively present an opinion or viewpoint in a short time, to stimulate, to simulate giving a presentation as part of a television broadcast. Thank you. <clears throat> My speech today is about what freedom really needs. Many problems assail the human race today. One of them is simply, what can be done with Iraq? Can we simply remove a dictator and allow freedom to automatically fill in the void? We've tried to simplify things, haven't we? Saddam is evil, ruling by fear and death to those who disagree with him. He must go. And he is gone, for the most part. But his legacies live on, and the legacies have plagued peace in the Middle East for centuries. We believed that all we had to do was get rid of his regime, and all would be well. It hasn't worked yet, has it? The final outcome is still in doubt. Let us hope that freedom and peace can exist in the Middle East and everywhere in the world. It's a goal worthy of our efforts. Today I'm going to discuss some things that we must be in guard, on guard about, what freedom really needs to flourish, and some lessons that we have learned in the past hundred years. Let us now consider two things that we must be on guard about. First thing is passionate beliefs. One thing that our leaders and our intellectual betters never lack is passionate belief. Some are good, some are not. Everyone who doesn't attend and support my church must be a sinner. Everyone whose skin color is different than mine must be evil. Everyone his, whose sexual preference is different must be a corrupting influence. Every man and woman is equal in the eyes of our creator and our law. There is always good in everyone. It is my obligation to help those in need. Some passionate beliefs are good and others present problems. We must be careful which ones we choose to believe. Second one, there is an odorless, odorless deadly gas prevailing our every free society on earth. It is neither political nor economic. It is the the culture of relativism. There are no absolutes. Nothing to use that's such as an anchor, such as there are as many truths as there are people. Follow your feelings. Do what you please. The culture of relativism provides no sure foundation on which to build. Strong foundations can be built on passionate beliefs. We must choose wisely when we choose what we believe. Freedom and democracy need three things to survive. First thing is sound families. A sound family does not consist of a man, a woman, and 2.3 children. Sound families do not depend on who is the breadwinner or even whether they are opposite sex partners. What sound families need are members who exhibit common decencies for each other, who share unafraid respect of one human for another, who perform little acts of virtue and have underlying commitments. These are the things that make a family sound. Second thing, democracies also need self-starters. People willing to, pre to forego current pleasures for future gains. Freedom cannot survive where 
as long as they are fed and entertained, people are dependent on others. Dependent people will soon become trapped and obedient to someone else. Freedom needs people who are willing to give and delay rewards. Perhaps the most important need for freedom is a conscience. Humans do not blindly obey the laws of nature, but they do have the ability to master their passions, bigotries, and ignorance. A conscience enables them to do that. Where citizens are guarded by an inner policeman, a conscience, there is no need for real policemen. Where there is no conscience, there will never be enough police to make a society civil. Here are three lessons that we have learned in the past century. First lesson, truth matters. Alexandro Solzhenitsyn said that when receiving his Nobel Prize in 1970, one single truth is more powerful than all the weapons in the world. The martyrs of our time have shown again and again that in truth lies human dignity. Second lesson, for all its faults, democracy is always better than dictatorships for all people. Only where law, limited government, and checks and balances exist can people enjoy civil liberty. The third truth, for all its faults, capitalism is better than socialism for the poor. More likely to raise them from poverty, educate them, and allow them to become all that they can be. I have spoken today of two things that control our actions, passionate beliefs and relativism. I followed that with things that Freedom needs to survive. Sound families, people who are self-starters, and perhaps most importantly, a conscience. I have also spoken of three lessons that we have learned in the past century. Truth matters. Democracy is better for all people than dictatorships. And capitalism is better for the poor than socialism. No one ever promised that free societies would endure forever. Tyranny, unfortunately, is the more frequent condition of the human race. Without proper nourishment, our free society may pass across the darkness of time like a splendid comet, then burn into ashes and disappear. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Glitchner. Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. All the education in the world won't help you get ahead in life if you can't express your ideas effectively. Every day, competition for advancement gets tougher and tougher. You need an edge. A Toastmasters Club can give you that edge. A low-cost learning experience for men and women, Toastmasters gives you the confidence to express your ideas to anyone. Get the Toastmasters edge. Thank you for uh, your patience. We are now going to enter our most important phase of the meeting, that is evaluations. So please welcome Bernard Gibson, who will evaluate our speaker today. Thank you. What 
freedom needs. What was the news event or current issue on which the editorial was based, what freedom really needs? And you spoke to the issue in Iraq with Saddam Hussein and uh, the war, the fact that we felt that if we got rid of his regime, all would be fine and it hasn't happened. And you made that clear right at the beginning what, you were, what your uh, topic was going to be. Was this clearly presented? Well, you spoke to the differences in people, religion, color, sexual preferences, and what constitutes a sound family. While we realize that the nuclear family is diminishing, I personally feel that it's still the best alternative, and I think that you presented the idea that, that this nuclear 2.5 children and all of that is not necessarily the best. So that and that was your point. That was your um, your opinion. So that was that was fine. And but another thing that you said that I thought was very interesting is that you said people, if I understood what you said right, you said people who are fed and entertained are not free; they depend on others. And from what I have heard, this is apparently what happened in ancient Rome and caused the fall of the Roman Empire was the fact that people that they had so many days of, of uh, entertainment and the Colosseums and that type of thing and you know, an easy life and what it, but anyway that's a part of what caused the fall of the human um, the Roman Empire not human Empire Roman Empire another story that I had heard about that and I'm just going to throw it in here uh, was a, if I can remember this right there used to be a lot of wild pigs in Georgia and pigs are very, wild pigs are very hard to capture. They wanted to capture these pigs. So what they did was they just put out food for the pigs every day. So they come up to a certain spot and they got used to coming to this spot and being fed. And then pretty soon they were able to just come with their nets or whatever, trucks, and, and capture these pigs. But that's what I thought of when, when you made that point. I thought that was very good. And you had some interesting words, passionate belief, to be careful what we choose to believe, relativism, that there are no uh, absolutes, no sure foundations, and conscience to match, master our bigotries and ignorance. I thought those were some very powerful words, and that truth matters, and it is a powerful weapon. But I thought that was very, very good. And of course, your three points were that Truth matters, powerful weapon. Democracies are better than dictatorships. And that capitalism, even with its, its weaknesses and, and um, um, whatever, I, I can't think of the word I want to say right now. But anyway, that capitalism is better for the, the uh, poor in the long run. One thing I felt that if this had been an actual broadcast, that it probably would have been more effective if you had been seated at a desk or a table and most likely more eye contact with the camera would have been good and could have been improved with practice and I realize you said that you'd, you hadn't had much time to practice this but if you'd been given a real um, editorial I believe that that would have improved it. I felt like your appearance was very appropriate, your dress and uh, your appearance does give authority to your words. And for the, and all in all, I felt that you did a very good job and I enjoyed your editorial and I enjoyed being your evaluator. Thank you. Thank you, Verna. Um, that's always an important part of our meeting and uh, we appreciate the feedback. And now I'd like to return control of the meeting to our president. So, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Dick. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and being with us as a part of TV Toastmasters. We had a speech and evaluation, and we always welcome the appearance of Dan Lather with us. That's a, an important part of our being. The one thing with TV, with any Toastmasters, is that you're able to express your opinions and not and people do support you even though they may not agree with what you're saying they do support you in your ability to 
present your ideas. So as timer, I was also timer today. Everyone was within their time limits. We did well on our timing. I would like to thank our floor director, Steve Ehrenholtz, and Nikki Bishop, who is running the camera, and also Rick, who is directing. And Rick also does the editing, and we'll be putting this together. I don't know, does anyone have anything to, that they would like to question about the meeting or anything about Toastmasters? We do have our division contest today where we have four people who will be giving a humorous speech. They're very humorous. They won their club contest. Then they went to the next level and won their area contest. And now they are competing in their division contest. And one of those will go on and compete in the district contest. So if we have nothing further, yes, Ray. I don't know if you mentioned this. I apologize for being late. But what I heard was, uh, as usual, very good and informative, uh, very good uh, evaluation of you are something even though I didn't get to hear the, uh, the speech. But, and uh, I know uh, you're a very busy person and uh, those do so many activities. And you had a little phone call with me last night. And I don't know whether you got a chance to tell the viewing audience, but as I understand it, you were uh, garnered with an award recently. Could you just, uh, I think everybody would be interested, even if uh, it came from you, the source <laughs> itself. Thank you, Ray, for bringing that up. Yes, I, I didn't want to toot my own horn, but I, Rick, when I was speaking to him yesterday, he said, congratulations on being named Division Governor of the Year. And I was quite surprised. There were two things that helped me be successful. One was time. I had the time to be able to spend doing the things that needed to be done. And I had a great team. And if my one team member who is here, Jerome, he was one of my area governors. And I didn't know how I would do as a division governor because I'm a doer. I can do, do, do. You want me to do something? I'll do it. But as a division governor, your job is to motivate the people to do things. And I had a great team. So time and team is what made me be successful. When I would call them to see how they were doing, they were ahead of the game. If I'd ask them, it's time to have your dues in, they already had been in contact with all the clubs. So my team, my time, helped me to be successful, and I am being rewarded for that. So if no one has anything else to bring, we will adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned.